Hi, this is Nick Hackett. I teach biology at Moraine Valley Community College. I wanted to talk a little bit about the scale of life, the history of life, and how people fit into that. What I want to start with is a familiar image to represent human civilization, the city of Chicago. If you look, of course, you can see the buildings, bridges, streets. If you look closely, you can see little tiny people to give you a sense of the size of this part of the city, the scale of human civilization and the scale of human accomplishment. We're not using a photograph though in this case. What I want to use instead is a representation, a graphic. Because I'm not representing a place, what I want to represent instead is a span of time. We're still talking about human civilization, but our silhouette is going to represent the time span of human civilization. The length from one side of the graphic of Chicago to the other side is going to represent the time span during which humans have accomplished everything that they've accomplished. All of human history, civilizations that have come and gone, all of that is going to be represented in this arrow. If you were to start on the right side of the arrow and move towards the tip of the arrow, you'd be moving back in time. That time span again would be the full time span of all things humans have built. We don't have an exact number, but we have a pretty close estimation for this, and this is about 10,000 years. The oldest bits of civilization, writings, uh, things people have formed, all of those go back about 10,000 years. If you were to travel back in time 10,000 years, you'd be predating most of what we understand as human civilization. You'd be coming before all of these things that humans have built and accomplished. If you were to go back in time 10,000 years, you'd actually see a pretty major extinction event, which is when we lost the last of the woolly mammoths and the saber-toothed tigers. But you'd still find human beings scattered around different parts of the globe. And if you went back in time a little bit further, you'd be able to find humans taking a very f important first step towards building human civilization, and that is the domestication of this animal. This is not a cow, but it was domesticated into what we call the cow. This is an image of what's called an auroch. This is not an actual photograph, it's a reconstruction photograph because these animals are extinct or they've been bred into a different form. But these animals have been familiar to humans for a long time. The cave paintings in France that are about 13,000 years old depict this animal. They're not showing domesticated aurochs, of course, that took a long time. But these were still familiar to people and then became a very, very important step towards building civilization, the domestication of animals, the beginnings of things like agriculture. We want to understand this period of time, though, in the larger scheme of things, in the larger scale of what was happening with life and what was happening on Earth. Our arrow is always going to represent 10,000 years in this scale. It's always going to represent the same time span for humans, the same graphic of what humans have accomplished. You can see the little image of the city is part of this corner of a larger blue square. And that blue square is going to be our ruler for a lot of the rest of this presentation. Because we're going to talk about very, very large spans of time. You can still see the arrow there on the right side. It still represents 10,000 years. The little Chicago image, if you can still see it, still represents the 10,000 years of human civilization. But mostly, we want to look at the big scale here, which is that if you were to multiply that civilization times 100, you would get 1 million years. This is our giant blue block, the 1 million year time span. This is a much easier number for us to use to understand the huge scales over which living things have evolved and changed. But we want to keep in mind the part of this that represents human civilization too. Even though we might lose track of how tiny that arrow is going to be, it's always there on the right side. If you were to go back in time a million years, you could actually find a number of different human ancestors and relatives spreading throughout the earth. This includes Homo erectus, which was alive about a million years ago, shown in the middle of this uh, image, which is recreations of what some of these faces of our ancestors and relatives would have looked like. Homo erectus was part of the first major expansions of humans across the globe, or at least out of Africa. 
Homo erectus had the beginnings of language and they used fire. And so these again are important parts of, of the steps towards human civilization. The ability to sit around a fire and talk is the beginnings of culture or even the continuation of culture. As you go back in the images up towards the top left, they become more and more distant. You can see that they're not even in the same genus as human beings, which is genus Homo. Human beings are Homo sapiens in the bottom right. But we want to pay attention especially to the one in the top left, the most distant ancestor, which you can see looks a lot more ape-like than human-like. This ancestor goes back about six or seven million years. All of those human ancestors have either been bred into the human population or died or killed off. And so humans are really the only relative or the only part of that branch left, the only representative of that genus. Our closest relative is the chimpanzee. And chimpanzees are actually pretty distantly related to us. To find the common ancestor of humans and chimps, you'd have to go back six million years. It wasn't necessarily the one shown in that last photo recreation, but there was an animal around that time that was the distant ancestor of both us and our closest relative. The steps back in time become much bigger. Living things evolve, but it does take a long time, and so the major milestones are sometimes big leaps. In this case, the arrow is going to represent the transfer back in time all the way to the top left of these blocks, 70 million years. 70 blocks each representing a million years each. 70 million years ago marked the beginning of an ice age and the end of a kind of climate disaster that wiped out the dinosaurs among lots and lots of other animals. This was a really important part of our evolution because the mammals were some of the animals that survived the ice ages and went on to prosper on Earth and they would not have been able to do that if the dinosaur reptiles hadn't been killed off by climate change. 70 million years ago, according to the fossil record, you could find the major ancestors of most of the mammal groups that we have right now. Cats, dogs, cows, and especially a lot of little things like shrews and bats, animals that hang around a lot in trees or in forests. This image is a recreation of the animal that was the distant ancestor of all primates. Primates includes apes, but it also includes monkeys and lemurs, and a lot of animals that look a little more like this. We can see our ancestry in the way that these animals are built. They of course hang around trees, they do a lot of climbing, so they have to use their, hand, uh, their paws, which became our hands, but you can also see a general body form. Brain and eyes in the front, digestive system through the middle, bones on the inside, of course, these animals had hair. That's what makes them mammals. We think about the dinosaurs existing forever ago, but the dinosaurs were really just the next step in this chain. And what we'll see is that it's pretty recent in terms of all of human evolution and all of animal and all of life evolution. Dinosaurs, of course, as we understand the group of dinosaurs, didn't really survive, and so their branch on the tree of life died off. And so we could go back in time 240 million years and find a lot of living things that didn't survive through that climate catastrophe or the Ice Age. There were some things that survived, some animals, some reptiles, mammals, of course. This is an image from the Smithsonian of one of the oldest dinosaurs based on some fossils, thought to have lived about 240 million years ago, really the beginning of the dinosaur age. This animal has a similar kind of body form, even if it's very, very uh, broad. Brain and eyes in the front, bones through the middle, head on one end and tail on the other, limbs based on the bones, digestive system running through the middle. We didn't evolve from these dinosaurs, but we can see a common ancestry, and you can also see that in our primate ancestor, and even as we get closer to modern times, how similar some of those other more related human ancestors were too. The jumps at this point are getting very big, and it's becoming impossible to represent the little block of time that was 10,000 years, all of human history. It would not be possible to show this dot on the current grid which represents 500 million year blocks. 
500 million years ago was a pretty significant time in evolution because of two major events. The first was that plants moved onto land around this time. And so plants evolved from simpler living things in the oceans and they colonized the land. If we imagine the earth, you imagine it covered in plants, but it was not always this way. It's the same with the ocean. We imagine the ocean is full of fish, but fish evolved from simpler animals. And there was a time when the ocean was not full of fish, that that started. Fish, of course, gave rise to the animals that eventually moved onto land and became things like amphibians and reptiles. Eventually, things like mammals, which survived through ice ages and lived onto the modern times. So we can see a little bit of our ancestry in this fish. This is a lamprey, and lampreys are modern fish. You can find them in lakes and streams, but they haven't really changed that much in 500 million years. So they give us a glimpse into what some of the most primitive fish look like. Eyes and brain on one end, head on one end, tail on the other, digestive system that runs through the middle, bones on the inside. Of course, primitive fish didn't have limbs or jaws. Those things evolved later. But we can see again this shared ancestry because of these shared features. The next big block is very significant in life, and that is the creation of a significant kind of cell, and that's called a eukaryotic cell. This was about 1,500 million years ago, or about one and a half billion years ago, when we first started to see evidence of a different kind of cell called a eukaryotic cell. The eukaryotic cell is different from the more primitive cell, which is called prokaryotic. This photo shows both. The prokaryotic, or what we usually call bacteria, are the little dark colored rods. And they're very small and very simple. This is the simplest way that you can have a living thing, a single-celled little bacteria. This eukaryotic cell in the photo, though, is the larger one. It's sort of shaped like Australia. It takes up most of the box. It has a giant spot in the middle that's the nucleus. And so this is a single cheek cell from a human Somebody to make this slide scraped their cheek and then stained it and also stained some of the bacteria that were in their mouth. And so you can see the tremendous scale difference between these cells. What this means is that there ends up being two different kinds of living things on Earth. The simple bacteria, which have one kind of cell, and all of the other living things that have the more advanced cell and became more advanced living things. Plants, animals, fungi, and a number of other more complex cells. Bacteria spend a lot of time on this planet alone, but the development of a new kind of cell, the development of a kind of cooperation where cells would work together, created this new piece, and this created a whole new branch on the tree of life, and we're part of that branch. The cells that make us up are eukaryotic cells, and those are about a billion and a half years old. We share a kind of ancestry with everything that is eukaryotic that has the same building blocks, whether it's an amoeba or a pine tree or some weird lemur. 500 million years before this, bacteria had figured out photosynthesis. If we think about life on Earth, Almost all of it depends on things that are green, things that take the energy from the sun and turn it into something that is useful, almost always sugar. And this is what photosynthesis is about, taking sunlight and turning it into a useful thing. This process changed life forever. When we think about photosynthesis, we usually think about plants, but plants, like all of the other living things, evolved from simpler forms. At this point in the history of life, really there are only bacteria on this earth. We hadn't evolved a second kind of cell that took another 500 million years. And so bacteria invented a photosynthesis. They invented a few different kinds of it, but the one that we're most familiar with is the green one. And there are bacteria that do this that are still around. These are called cyanobacteria. You can find these all over the place in ponds, lakes, and things like that. Just little, little tiny green cells that just soak up sunlight. But we wouldn't have any life without this. 
all of the complex life that we see and understand is based on things that feed off of photosynthesis, whether they're doing the photosynthesis themselves or eating the things that do photosynthesis or eating the things that are eating the things that are doing photosynthesis. The last big jump here is meant to represent all the way to the beginning of the first life, the first living things. And we don't know exactly when that happened. We do have some evidence that there was life around about 3,500 million years ago. But where it came from is still kind of a mystery. You can see at this point it's becoming a little difficult to even see the shape of the M's. We have to have so many in the scale to show you 3,500 million little steps. Bacteria are too simple and small to leave a fossil, but they do leave a kind of footprint. And so if we look at certain kinds of rocks that are called stromatolites that are very ancient, we can actually see patterns in the rocks that aren't caused by geology. These little things that almost look like little mountains are caused by the release of gases and chemicals from living things. And so this is a kind of footprint of bacteria. We don't necessarily know where they came from, but we know that they were around and they were alive and these were the living things that gave rise to all of the other living things that we've talked about. Of course it did take them two billion years to figure out how to make a new kind of cell and so it's not like these kinds of things happen quickly. When we talk about life on earth we're really talking about bacteria on earth. Three and a half billion years. Most of this time the living things that we understand and we experience and we can imagine did not exist and almost all the ones that we've talked about just came about in the last number of boxes. There are thousands of boxes here where it was just bacteria on earth, nothing else. And so when we think about life we really are talking about bacteria and the planet that they colonized and all the living things that evolved from them. Earth is a little bit older than this. And so it's not that bacteria e evolved or appeared instantly on Earth. There was a billion or so years where the Earth was empty. And so if you can imagine this scale, this is one way that we can think about this huge amount of time. Each little m represents a million years. And 4,500 of those is 4.5 billion years. Bacteria have been around for a long time, as far as we understand the fossil record, about 78% of the Earth's time span. So there was still a billion years, which is a tremendous amount of time with no life, but once it started, it flourished. Photosynthesis is one of the most significant things that living things have ever come up with. But that's been around for less than half of the Earth's time span. The cells that make up our body, called eukaryotic cells, have only been around for about a third of the Earth's time span. And fish have only been around for about 11%. When we say fish, we're talking about a very broad, humongous group of different living things. But as far as we understand modern fish right now, we can say that there was a beginning point. The same thing with mammals. Mammals, of course, evolved from other animals the same way that fish and eukaryotes did. Mammals, as we understand the whole group, have been around for just over 1% of the Earth's time span. Human beings, a type of mammal, have been around for four hundredths of a percent of the Earth's time span. Essentially a flash at the end of the time span on bacteria planet. I use this image from Chicago mostly as a way to describe the scale of time. But I didn't really use this image exactly, I just used the representation of a city, the representation of a civilization. If you look at this picture, you can see actual scale of size. You can see buildings, you can see buses and cars, you can see people, bridges, streets, and understand how big some of these things are. We can take a person from this photograph. They're probably too small for you to be able to see. This woman right here is going to represent the average height of the American woman, which is about 5 feet 4 inches. This is roughly 173 centimeters. So to make the math easy, this woman is about 1.6 meters tall.
If we're to measure bacteria cells, we actually find that they have some different sizes, but on average they're about 1.5 micrometers or micrometers tall. A micrometer is a millionth of a meter. It's a thousandth of a millimeter. And so we can convert this to centimeters, or we can also think about this in terms of how big your body is. If we were to stack these particular bacteria one after another end on end, we'd need a million of them to reach the height of the average woman. Bacteria actually outnumber your, your cells in your body, so even though your eukaryotic cells are a thousand times bigger than a bacteria cell, the bacteria are so tiny they can uh, cover a lot of space and colonize a lot of areas and still not take up a whole lot of room. And so you're outnumbered by bacteria in your body about 10 to 1. Your mouth, for example, is what we call your oral microbiome, and that contains more than 10 back billion bacteria cells, including more than 700 species. These are pretty rough estimates. But the idea is still that there's a humongous number of tiny little cells that are beyond our view, too small for us to see just like the span of human civilization is too small for us to see when we're imagining the whole scale of life on Earth. Your mouth is simply one of the many environments that bacteria colonize on your body, and we find hundreds of different varieties depending on where it is on your body, where you live, where you grew up, and all of these other individual factors. Your body is a universe to bacteria. You exist on a scale that is far beyond them or even being able to visualize them. The same way that it's hard for us to imagine 10,000 years in the scale of four and a half billion years, it's hard to imagine the scale of one tiny bacteria cell against the universe of your body.